Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the living God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. For over 90 years, the Easter Gospel has been proclaimed from this very pulpit by a whole variety of clergy who have served this community. And just as each priest has interpreted the story in different ways to meet different ages, so the story speaks to us afresh. And the church and the clergy, in the words of St. Francis of Assisi, we are called to preach the gospel and to use words if we have to. And so we draw upon the faith of our ancestors, the ancestors who built uh, St. Paul's Church, uh, the second church that was built on this site, uh, was built during the American Civil War, and members of this congregation would have intimately been connected with the Maurer Military Hospital just down the road, serving something like 20,000 veterans of the Civil War, just a railway stop away from Chestnut Hill. And when this present building was consecrated, the nation and the world were reeling from the economic impact of the 1929 Wall Street crash. The community, the nation, and the economy all recovered and moved through a turbulent century with another global world war. And the prayers of the people and the proclamation of the Easter Gospel and the light of the Paschal Candle, that served this community through all that turbulent change as it does for us today. 
But this may be the first time in recent history, on such a global scale, that the gospel of the resurrection is proclaimed to the church no longer limited by our buildings and holy places. Just as we proclaim a gospel where Jesus has been liberated from death and the limitations of an earthly body in a tomb, we may hear the gospel of the resurrection in a very different way this year. In his book, How Buildings Learn, Stuart Brandt reflects on the process where we design, architects design beautiful buildings, and then they shape us, they define us. And he reflects on older and sacred spaces where soul is tangible, prayers, conversations, human toil is part of the patina that makes a space such an inspiration to the generations who inhabit it. He talks about the relationship between new ideas coming from old spaces. And we begin to understand ourselves as a church that for a time is exiled and forced to understand ourselves as the presence of the risen Christ in the world. The stones have been rolled away. He is not here. He is risen. He has gone ahead of us. So Easter is not a day, but Easter is a season. It is the reflection of the 40 days of Lent when we look for Jesus outside of where we might expect to find him. And the risen Lord is not always obvious or even known to us in the same way as we will hear these stories over the Easter season. Each resurrection appearance is different may even be contradictory, but he goes ahead of us from sacred space in Jerusalem. He goes ahead of us to Galilee, the workplace, the place of first encounter, back where we started, a spiral moment of recognition and seeing the ordinary differently. The Christ energy takes us to unimaginable places, to do extraordinary things, as it did 2,000 years ago, to nobodies like Mary of Magdala, or Peter, that rough fisherman who runs away from Jesus when the going gets tough. And the transformation of human beings, and especially these two central characters in our readings today, invite us to think about our own place in the great story of salvation. Gilbert Shaw once wrote, we must accept the fact that this is an age in which the cloth is being unwoven. We must accept the fact that this is an age in which the cloth is being unwoven. It is therefore no good to try to patch. We must rather set up the loom on which coming generations may weave new cloth, according to the pattern God provides. And maybe this dramatic opportunity of change and dislocation reminds us that it is no good to patch, but how do we resurrect our community to go forward into the new age? Just as Jesus came 2,000 years ago as a healer, a gardener of the soul, the essence of the mystery we call God, the light in the darkness. Jesus' healing and tending of this earth and of the people he came to, these healings are themselves symbols. They're kind of parables of much more than the cure of physical disease. The healing becomes an indicator of the way God wills human existence and life to be. So as heralds of the gospel, we are also heralds of this new age of weaving new cloth, interpreters of events that raised and continue to raise more questions than answers. Jim Cotter, who wrote part of the New Zealand prayer book that we've been using, said this, Jesus did not escape from crucifixion, but he went through it. He did not expel the evil that came at him, 
but absorbed and transformed it. He withstood, stood under, understood, enduring as seeing the one who is invisible. Maybe that's a different framework for us to think about this frightening virus. Jesus did not escape from crucifixion, but he went through it. He did not expel the evil that came at him, but he absorbed and transformed it. He withstood, he stood under, he understood. So I wonder this Easter, what is the difference between life as we know it and resurrected life in 2020? What might crucifixion and resurrection mean to us? What does dying to self or the transformation of our society as we know it and being raised with Christ might look like? And how do the scriptures shed light for us in this darkness, in this difficult road? And resurrection in our gospel. Resurrection begins not on the mountaintop, not about certainty, but resurrection begins in the cemetery. Resurrection begins in the lostness of a soul called Mary, who just wants to be allowed a quiet place to mourn her dead friend. And in that darkness and cemetery, the mulch of resurrection, damp, earthy, and the Easter story is filled with the breaking through of assumptions. Mary is like us because she wants it all tied up. She wants it all matter of fact. She wants Jesus to be dead and in the tomb. She wants to have a good cry. She is missing Jesus. She wants to be healed and transformed. But it's not what she wants. It's not what she's expecting. She is confronted with a new reality. Nobody, nowhere to mourn. And she moves from grief to anger. Somebody must have stolen the body. And she bargains with the stranger gardener just to give it back. And she cannot see resurrection has already happened. As a first century woman, Mary had no standing in her society. Her testimony and that of any woman in a court of law was worthless. And so she turns to Peter and to John. She turns to a man to help her out. And they are useless. They go in and look and then they go home. And so Mary has to keep going through that stuff that she doesn't want to look at. Mary is still very unsettled. She continues to push through her projections, her misunderstandings, and her grief that is very real. And no human soul can comfort her in her grief. And she enters into that deeper soul space. And I think about people in our country on this day, so many Americans who have been lost and thousands upon thousands of people who are mourning in their grief and those voices that will come to us will come to them and there'll be conversations with themselves and it's like the messages of the angels that are having a conversation with Mary from this other dimension as if in a dream. Why are you weeping? And her complaint and grief is still in the fact that someone stole the body of her dead hero. Nothing is sacred. Someone must be to blame. And the question, I don't know, is something that Mary cannot yet grasp or to be able to say. I don't know where they have laid him. So she turns to see someone standing beside her right in front of her and it's Jesus and she doesn't recognize him. She is blinded by grief and wanting to figure it all out in her own terms and she is still following her own story. Someone stole the body and I don't know where it is. And Jesus articulates the same question, woman why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And I love this next verse where it says, supposing him to be the gardener. And she blames the gardener for taking the body of Jesus. And again, she bargains with him. Just tell me where you put him 
and I'll take him away. And then there's this moment of intimacy where Jesus mentions her name, Mary. This identity link. And something triggers her sight. And she calls Jesus Rabboni, teacher, my master. And she wants to hold on to him, to hug him, to feel again his physical presence. But that's not appropriate right now either. Mary continues to do all the right intuitive things, but she keeps just not getting this new reality. And she has to be in a different kind of imaginative relationship with the Jesus she once knew. In the same way that many of us who have lost loved ones, we have to be in a different kind of imaginative relationship with them that is often about not holding on, but letting go, not to control, not to be extensions of our agendas. Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to my Father. The message is simple. The resurrection is not an end in itself. The resurrection is just another stage. Where he's going, I have not yet ascended to my Father. It is about the ascension not only of Jesus, but about the ascension of the whole of humanity to a different relationship with ourselves and with the mystery we call God. I am going, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And this account of the resurrection, uh, they're all different, all the accounts are different, but it is assuming in John the resurrection is happening immediately on that day, that he is going off to this different dimension. And that Mary is then, again as a woman with no legal standing, she is commissioned to go as an apostle and to tell the disciples that uh, Jesus is going ahead of them. To my God and to your God. Extraordinary. And Mary is forever transformed. And so the early church interprets the resurrection of Christ and the conveying of this new insight as a huge marking point in our self-understanding of being brothers and sisters of the same parent God. It's interesting that the word Lord that Mary uses, um, in, in its contemporary setting, that was reserved for the emperor, the king, the president. And so Mary is making a political statement in the gospel. And again, the understanding, if you look at the context in which Mary and Peter and Paul are working, you know, we think when Paul is talking about Jesus is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings and Savior of the world, these were all terms that were given to the emperor who demanded to be worshipped and deified by his subjects. So the church is saying something else about our relationship to the state that there is another ethical higher power that we are called to honor in resurrection. And that the Roman state system of crucifixion is the very act by which Jesus was himself destroyed. But even the state has no power over him. I was trying to think of some modern day examples of this um, crucifixion resurrection image that is in the gospels in our readings today. And I remember a story from Uganda set in 1977 when Archbishop Janani Luwum was the then Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Uganda. And the church was um, really terrified and the country was terrified by the dictatorship of Idi Amin. Something like a million people um, were lost in civil war, but many people were going missing. And so the church stood up to him. And Lewum was arrested and taken away. And he was assassinated personally uh, by, our, by Idi Amin. And they staged a car crash. They put his body, but there were, there were gunshot, there were gun wounds in his body. And it was clear that he had been assassinated by the state. And one of the things, one of the powerful images that they, the government would not release Lewum's body. And so there were 5,000 people who turned up to the cathedral in uh, Navaremi Cathedral. 
and there was no body. And so what did they do? They proclaimed, he is not here. He is risen. And so for that time, for that age, the resurrection meant a whole different thing. But it was about that the state has no power over us in the way that they want to. So we think about that in our own, in our own days. And even a more recent story, the story of uh, the rather unfortunate story of Captain Brett Crozier of the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And in March, he writes um, a memo to his superiors that he's worried about 5,000 members of his crew with coronavirus and how does he separate those who are infected and those who are not. And he gets fired. He gets fired and this is conflict between the interests of the state, the security of the state, and the interests and the security of his crew. And it's interesting, we've all seen those pictures of the crew cheering him on as he leaves, as he leaves the ship. And again, that tension between the, the ethical standards of what motivates us, sometimes the church and the state, we are in conflict. There are times in our histories where the best interests of humanity and the church conflict with the policies of the state. So the resurrection of Christ is always be a kind of final up yours to any state-sponsored violence or self-interested action. So as I said, each generation and each era will read this story of resurrection differently and its power as I try to unpack it today. And so the power of it, it can still speak to us, different people, different circumstances, but the same human comforting, enlightening, and courage-filled message. Death, you have no power over us. State, we serve another God. Paul and Mary, give me alternative sources of inspiration and guide in troubled times. So just as Jesus beaten, destroyed by forces, that he did not shirk away from. We in the Easter season, in the next 40 days, will be looking at how resurrection and transformation can come out of this death-dealing pandemic. And just as scriptural appearances of the risen one take on different disguises and dimensions, they're not all the same, and, and often he's not recognized. And whether the Ugandans in their hour of terror and need or Captain Crozier and his crew, and the nation watching what is unfolding. We will know in the next 40 days. Jesus goes ahead of us. That's the message. And there's so much that we still don't know. There is so much that is still to be revealed. And so as we journey together as a community of faith, we give thanks for the inspiration of the resurrection, for the inspiration of the ancestors who have gone before us and those who continue to be Christ's presence in our world that Christ calls us to heal and transform. Christ is risen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.